That's true. Uh, the National Stock Assessment Program is kind of uh, working towards getting around that problem. I work closely with the uh, National Modeler, who's a fisheries person. You know, my background is mathematics and computer science. I don't necessarily know a whole lot about the needs of the fisheries community. So it's really good that I have dialogue with fisheries people. Okay, so now it comes to the process. Basically, you have a vision when you start off. If you don't know what you're supposed to make, you're not going to make the right one. Okay? This happens to a lot of people. Um, be systematic. Um, and then iterative development is key to And make it work first and then optimize it. Okay, so now we're talking about your coding. Um, you don't need to come for it in. So there's a natural tendency to say, oh, we can put a hook in here for something more. Here's a distribution. So a different phase of development. Why not integrating it? Um, and then reuse code whenever you can. Uh, this is why I like object-oriented programming. You can reuse code that's pretty seamless. And I'll get into that too. And then another thing is, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. Just have it though. You can use uh, libraries that already exist, but you know, for instance, say you're building a software project, uh, a big enterprise level project, you might want to incorporate, uh, I don't know, let's just say a uh, matrix library. Now it's like deeply, your project is deeply dependent on that. That third party project was out of favor, no longer is maintainable. You've got so my advice would be to use um, third-party software as long as it's not uh, fundamental to the function of your application. And then uh, remember, debugging code is harder than writing it, so just write clear code. Self-describing code goes a long way. Um, you know, people get new jobs, people come in and fill in for them. It just makes it easier for everybody. So now we're going to get enough, Andre, we're going to get into these programming paradigms. Unless anybody has any questions on those four first. Yep. All right. So structure program. You know, what is it? Well, it was basically taking a program and dividing it into little easier, um, little pieces that are easier to understand. And structure programming is considered to be uh, the precursor to object oriented programming. Object-oriented programming is essentially uh, an extension of structured programming. I've seen a lot of your ADMD code. A lot of people use structured programming. But uh, so the, the reason to use um, structured programming is because it makes the code really easy to understand, modularizing everything, and you can modify things in the uh, affecting different components of the main component of the application. And so essentially what you're doing is you're dividing the problem in the subsystems. Okay. So like, I know it's a horrible slide, I'm not very artistic, but if you see what's going on here, we have this, you know, we've modularized the problem. So you know, spawn a recruitment module, we're going to do that, and we're going to come back down, immortality, and so on, um, as opposed to having all this logic That's the essence of structured programming. Here's another slide, same sort of thing. The module, independent of one another. One might take input from another one, but logically they're independent. You take input, output, you can test them independently without having them, without having them in, the, in the application itself. So now we're going to move on to object oriented programming. You know, I could spend a lot of time week of just this, but uh, I've only got 50 minutes. But these are important concepts because it all trace back to modularity. Um, so what is object-oriented programming? Well, it's a modeling construct where we're talking about taking, creating a module, 
and encapsulated data functions inside a single unit, right? Um, like take a real world object, let's say, what we do, a software object or, yeah, software object is like a representation of a real world object. Just like real world objects, um, software objects, they have state behavior. Uh, in this example here, like a dog has, it's, it's got state, name, color, breed, behavior, barking, drooling, but state and behavior, important concepts. And then some uh, more key concepts of object oriented programming are uh, encapsulation, polymorphism, inheritance. So encapsulation is this idea that you're hiding data and methods from the user. They only call the functions that they need, right? Uh, I'll get into that in a second. And then polymorphism is like uh, you can have um, entities that are implemented in multiple ways. And then inheritance, um, you can reuse code fragments. So encapsulation, I mentioned it. It's like uh, the idea of hiding data and behavior, behavior meaning functions uh, from the user. So you just call a function, but you are using encapsulated information in that class to return a value. Um, the benefits are um, you're protecting data because you're hiding it. The compiler won't let you touch it. Um, it gets you both flexible and extensible. And uh, let's see, it reduces complexity. It's really easy to read object oriented code. And you know, you're in the end, you're lowering uh, coupling between code fragments. Everything's an independent, independent module of like by design with object oriented program. And that, you know, remains beautiful. So polymorphism. It's in the, in the dictionary, it's uh, defined as an organism that can have many states or many forms. And we just apply this to the software objects. Now I got some code here. Yeah. Here we have selectivity base and it's got a signature evaluate. And then we inherit, we'll get, we'll get into inheritance from uh, C++ or coding. Now we're gonna have a logistic selectivity curve and a double logistic selectivity curve. Hope I coded those right. But um, basically, what's going on here? Selectivity base has two different forms now, right? So we can one is select, uh, logistic and one is double logistic. So same signature, different logic. And that's where the thing is encapsulated. Ready to go back? That make sense? So now we'll talk about inheritance, and this is really important. Uh, how many how many people actually code in C plus plus or object coding program? <laughs> Okay, so we a few. Um, this is where we say that uh, you can define a class in terms of another class. So you can reuse those encapsulated components from one class into the derived class. Right? Um, and then you can derive from multiple classes. And that's important because we're reusing code. There's no sense in writing code over and over again. So we have this. Class shape, and you see it's got um, set by set with this, uh, members or methods in the class, and then it's got some encapsulated data there. Right? But, so now we're going to inherit from that in our rectangle class. And you see my rectangle class, I don't have to redefine set by set with or uh, the members by width. It just automatically inherits those values in the class, we're extending shape. So right here, I instantiate a rectangle, I set the height, I set the width, and I have to call the area that we defined here. And there's our derivation list. These are, uh, these are the, the parent classes that rectangle has. And then you can see here, as I mentioned, 
rectangles and parenting methods from shape. Okay. Paradigms over, putting paradigms over. This is the very important stuff when you're developing software. Key concepts to keep in mind while you're developing, while you're uh, planning, while you're designing. Modularity. Alan, we've been talking about modularity for about seven years now. Yeah. Um, so, Modularity, reusability, extensibility, extensible design, iterative development, and scalability all enhance the end goal is maintainability. You know, we want to reduce that cost, that 80% cost, the lifetime of the project. We want to reduce that as much as possible. So, what is a module? It's a well defined independent component, like a function or an object, structured programming or function. Object oriented programming and object. Uh, each one of them performs a logically discrete function, right? Takes some input, gives you some output. Doesn't depend on anything. Independent module. Logic should flow without depending on any other modules. At least that's the goal. Um, and these are building blocks for larger components. So think like. Uh, Back to our you know, generalized stock assessment program, uh, framework, mortality, selectivity, and all these other modules that are in there. We can extend them, you know, extend out on all of them, but they're independent of each other. Um, yeah, we can we can test them and we can we can code them in isolation. So, like Karina and I work together on the modeling team. She could be working with a selectivity module. I could be doing um, recruitment. Her code is not going to affect my code because we're independent of one another. So once we commit back in, there's no conflict, no coupling there. What she's working on, what I'm working on. So modularity is really important. We couldn't do that if we had all that logic in a series, you know, in line. Um, so yeah, this is an example of our module. Another bad graphic. So reusability, we talked about this the object oriented programming, but it's a product of modularity. And reusability is important. Um, we can use existing elements, uh, and it doesn't just mean code. We can use uh, test suites, um, like, uh, anything in the development life cycle, like uh, designs, documents, what we do. And then extensibility. So this is the measure at which we can um, amend a software component without having to re-engineer the whole thing. So um, if you can do that, it's said to be extensible. Right? So if you have a module that you can extend out without having to re-engineer anything on the basic framework, that module is said to be extensible. So, extensible design means that up front, you realize, just like Pumala said, is that we don't know if we're going to need or what we're going to need in the future. So, we just plan for extensible. Right? We plan for it ahead of time. We just plan for it ahead of time. We say instead of it being a module or something else like that. But, like Ian said, uh, new science comes up, we extend it where it's necessary. Um, so it allows you to make changes, um, small, uh, small changes upon request. Um, you know, kind of like agile development. Is, is anybody here familiar with agile development? Like two or three. Okay. What's up? I know uh, John. Oh, John, there he is. Mr. Agile. Oh. <laughs> uh, so the, the key, the big thing about extensibility is you're reducing uh, any dependencies. You're extending outward from a module. So um, iterative development, again, this is like a divide and conquer thing. So we've broken up the problem. We got a basic framework. All of our modules are coming up. We iteratively develop as we go. 
come back, so we keep going till we hit our goal to really move forward. Okay, now this is this is a, a really important one to keep in mind while we're developing um, scalability. Um, so what is scalability? Well, you know, it's the measure at which uh, a software product can take increased workload. You know, um, without having to be re-engineered to handle an increased workload. So we probably all experienced uh, failures in scalability. Uh, you have a model, it started off, you had a small amount of data, and then it's around and suddenly you get more data. It takes five hours, and you get more data, and next thing you know, it's taking five days. Or it never completes. Everybody here I'm sure has experienced something like that. So we want to plan ahead of time, use appropriate data structures and these things, use uh, the CPU wisely. But the system is said to be scalable, but it doesn't require re-engineering. And workload, it could be number of users, amount of data, uh, anything in that nature that pushes the software past its initial design capacity. Um, so if you design for scalability up front, you're going to save yourself a lot of money. You only have two options. Got to scale and go. So what's the problem with scaling failures? I think we all know. Uh, it becomes a period of productivity. You can't get things done if you're waiting around for something to finish. Um, fixes, they add complexity. Another chain of complexity. And that increases cost. And then users abandon the product. You've seen that too. So you have a couple options to handle scaling failures. Scale up. You got the money, that's cool. Basically, what you're doing is you're throwing advanced hardware at the problem, faster CPU, more memory. Like I said, it's the most expensive. So the industry favor is to scale out, use what you have more wisely, or maybe add more of the same hardware, but you're not there saving money on cost. You know, maybe there's some components that you can uh, update the length of current, take advantage of what you have, things like that. Cost is lower. And so maintainability, all those things come down to maintainability. It's like uh, they all collapse down on, on the maintenance of your software. The high cost element. So maintenance is defined as um, changes made to the software after its initial release. And maintainability is the ease at which you can maintain or which you can change the software. So there's three categories of maintenance. There's corrective maintenance, this is where we fix the problem. There's adaptive maintenance. This is where uh, the environment changes. New operating system, new hardware, whatever. You gotta make corrections in the code in order to handle the new environment. And then of course there's uh, perfective maintenance where you're always trying to make software one more. Again, these are something you will find in any software engineering book, but these are the um, software quality characteristics that um, enhance maintainability. So flexibility is a big one. How easy can you amend the software? Um, reliability, is it performance or supposed to be? Uh, portability, you know, run on a Windows computer, a Mac, Linux, Good characteristic. Uh, testability, how easy is it to test and review? And then uh, understandability, does it make sense? You know, like that, that user, you know, you heard the term black box software. You don't want black box software. Um, and then usability, how e easy is it to use? How much time do I have? Okay, cool. I think we can get into this. Better code. Unless anybody has any questions from what I was talking about before. Okay. okay, coding convention is a good idea. Uh, why have a coding convention? Well, I keep saying this 80% of the lifetime cost of a software project is in maintenance, right? 
and somebody's always going to come along, a new person's going to come along and maintain the software. If you don't have a coding convention, it makes it hard for somebody to come along and just fill in that role. We got to figure out the convention, figure out what the software is, all that kind of stuff. And um, usually, software is not maintained by the original author. Um, that's John Dewell. Uh, and uh, you know, code conventions they just improve uh, readability. So here's something common ones for programming languages. I don't know if anybody programs in Java in our community. Anybody? Yeah. Okay. It is the number one programming language in the world, actually. Not too long ago, but uh, these are the common ones. Uh, useful comments. Comments are necessary, uh, especially if you walk away from a project for a long time and you come back. Kind of helps you get really good. Um, but you know, when it comes to writing comments, if something's really easy to understand, just write a one liner or complicated stuff, give it a paragraph, really complicated blocks of code. Uh, spell it out in words, what it's doing, right before the block. It helps anybody else that comes after you. And then this takes us to the self describing code. This is something that we don't think about too much, but there is something to it. You know, make the symbols human readable. Uh, it makes source code easy to understand. Uh, it makes it easier to maintain and extend. You know, for instance, that's not self describing what this is. I know what this is doing. It's calculating, it's not doing a lookup, it's calculating a logistic selectivity giving some age, right? Calculate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, how many of you use an actual uh, integrated development environment? Two people, three people, four people. <laughs> no, not really. I mean, it's almost. How many of you use like Sublime? The uh, text editor. No, I would recommend if you're going to write code, use an actual integrated um, development environment. There's like a million tools that are just ramp up your product. Um, which one do you use? Visual Studio? Yeah, Visual Studio is a good one for Windows. Um, I have a preference for NetBeans. Some people have Eclipse. Um, but anyways, they expand your capability. A lot of tools in there that you can just leverage. Testing suites. Uh, you can navigate around the codes. So I can, I can right-click on, on a call to a function and say, they take you to the declaration. It might Miles away from where I'm at when this pops up. Um, auto completion is a big one. Uh, automatic code generation. Um, refactoring, huge. Does anybody really know what refactoring is? No? Are you the only one? Okay, so in an IDE, uh, let's just say you want to change the name of something, you know, a member and class, right? You might be accessing that. Let's say change the name of a function. And it might be called several places within the code. So you can't just do a find and replace, right? So IED has your whole code parsed to an abstract syntax tree, right? It's living in a tree. So they can search the tree and say anywhere that that column is made, we'll replace it with a new one. It's uh, uh, much better than something like a find and replace. It allows you to change code without. Um, you know, screwing up the functionality of the software. It's a really good tool. It's my favorite tool in IT. And then, you know, a lot of them, that means you just hit a warning as you type it. They'll give you a warning problem. Uh, automatic, automated testing, huge. You can just create a test suite from inside the IT. Big one. Um, integrated debuggers, nice. Profiling. Uh, <laughs> Integrated source control. My, my IDE talks directly to VLAB uh, 
uh, as our um, code line. So that's a nice feature. And then uh, auto code formatting, auto code completion, and then call graph generation. A lot of times the software engineers like to review call graphs. I don't know if there's anybody ever seen what a call graph looks like. But, so basically, it's just a big tree of printed call graph. But that, you know, we follow, we'll print it out, follow it, stuff like that. But that we use that. Um, so I just talked about what refactoring is. But basically, it's uh, you're changing the internal structure of something without harming the actual software itself. Um, you know, it could be several different things, but it just helps um, people to understand the code better. Um, it is a big one. Uh, global variables, anybody use them? <laughs> horrible. Absolutely horrible. Uh, the problem with global variables is you can touch them from anywhere in the code. So it's really hard to track down what you're doing if you do something wrong by mistake. So just try to avoid them. And if you, if you are going to use them, pass them into a function. Don't just modify them, create a function to pass it, pass it in as a uh, parameter. But try not to use them. Sometimes you can't avoid it. Like uh, if you've got a reverse mode auto diff library, you're going to have a, a global tape. Right? You can't get around it. There's no way of getting around it. So sometimes you just can't get around it, but you just got to be careful about how you use it. Um, maybe anything else. The big problem with all these modular programming, no bueno. Um, meaningful names. Meaningful names. Uh, what the heck does FYR mean? Does it? I don't know. So yeah, just spell out first. Come on, makes it easy for people. And again, we got this example: calculate logistic selectivity. Right? Uh, we know exactly what this thing is doing. It's doing a calculation, not a lookup, but return the logistic selectivity for the value of age. And the verb calculate again tells us that it's calculated. That? That's industry standard, Andre. Hey, I copied and pasted this off of your code. Okay, yeah, so uh, in your directory structure, meaningful, you know, meaningful names again, make them meaningful. You know, but try not to keep yourself deep. Shallow directory structure. You don't need you know, four layers deep. It's hard to, hard to maintain. Um, you know, keep it simple. But here's a big one split up the directory by modules. Version control. Uh, who uses GitHub? Almost everybody. Anybody you can stuff with anymore? No. Uh, how about everybody? Okay, so basically, if you want to use something, uh, just use whatever works best for you and your team. Um, there's one software one. It doesn't look like anyone uses any of the other ones. Document generators, I find these to be pretty cool, actually. You could basically write your design document, comments in your code. Something like Doxygen or Roxygen will create a user's guide for you or whatever. Um, very cool. Uh, really handy for large projects, large enterprise open projects where there's a lot of stuff going on. It's just easier to navigate around some HTML pages and stuff. Um, so, yeah, really good to keep for keeping track of what's going on. So, code efficiency. This is a little bit more fun part. Um, Obviously, code efficiency plays an important role in runtime and memory usage. Uh, so basically, the goal is to reduce the amount of uh, resource consumption. 
Uh, basically, the more efficient the code, the faster it can run, less memory. So here's some examples of that. Is that look horrible to you? Is it? Uh, you know, again, I copy and paste that here. So there's a couple of reasons why it's horrible code. It's a spelling error. But uh, does anybody see what it is? All those case statements are super expensive. You call those a thousand times, two thousand times, and they're going to be elevated to one time. So this would be an inefficient way to do it. Um, this would be a more efficient way of structured programming sense. We have all these functions, we put them in an array of pointers, and we enumerate the value, we set them upon initialization. We could just call the appropriate function from the array without having to put on the case statement. We save our, uh, ourselves a lot of CPU cycles. Case statements cause jump, 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 and all those jumps are very expensive. So the correct function will be called. So we can extend this to the object oriented sense. So we had, uh, you know, again, recruitment model base. Um, we create a couple of recruitment models, same thing. And then on initialization, we have here this uh, recruitment model on the top, you see that, that pointer? Okay, so now we're getting into polymorphism that we talked about earlier. So based on what value we're supposed to use, we can initialize that pointer, instantiate an object there. And then again, the proper recruitment function is called without the use of case statements. Very smooth, uh, faster, efficient. Uh, profiler. Anybody ever use a profiler before? One, two, three, four. Four people. Everybody should have a profiler. Uh, they're, they're really handy. They can, you can figure out from the profiler where your bottlenecks are to go. Um, look at things like memory consumption, uh, CPU usage. Um, like I said, they find, you find bottlenecks quickly. You can collect stats how many times you're calling a function. Um, things of that nature, how much time you spend on a function. Here's an example. I don't know if you read that. Is it hard to read? I figured it would be. Um, but basically, what's going on here is that you have a cell number eight, and you just punch in another column. Last one there, the top one, you get six. Column here, the top one, check in. So I, I suggest everybody have a uh, profiler. I don't know, does R have a profiler? Okay. Um, yeah, so vital information. So to sum it all up, use a discipline and a systematic approach to your development. And modularity is key. Use a modular design pattern. Um, keep things simple. Uh, use a structure or object oriented programming paradigm. And remember the those key concepts that lead to maintainability is modularity, um, extensibility, scalability. Uh, it's not all there, but it's not extensible design, incre uh, incremental development. They all lead to better maintainability. So if you keep these in mind during the course of the project, you, know, you should end up with a, a maintainable project. And then, you know, of course, use efficient and readable code. And I recommend profiling off. And that's all I got. Thank you.
Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that the C plus plus component of PMB, there's some examples of that. Uh, there's definitely examples of that in the ADMB C plus plus code. Yeah, I mean, okay, I can do that for you. I mean, if you want to work on that while we're here, you got a specific example. <laughs> Come up here and ask your question. Okay, the question was how easy how easy is it to get buy-in from scientists to go this room? Um sometimes it's not honestly. Um but we really want to uh, talk about things like the maintainability. Um yeah, like I mentioned, uh, so what happens a lot of times is a scientist they develop something to solve a quick problem, and then all of a sudden it becomes to go to for a lot of other scientists. Right? So if we can get them to use these principles up front and part of your toolbox, part of your arsenal for developing this stuff, then we, we kind of avoid a lot of these problems that we later on. So Right, yeah, you know, um, basically, uh, this presentation was uh, addressing something at the enterprise level, like, um, you know, that's a stock assessment framework. Um, but when you're talking about, you know, small projects on somebody's laptop, they're using, I mean, it's a little bit harder, but the approach there would be is to look at what they're doing and maybe re-engineer that if it becomes uh, something that's new kind of community. And um, one, one, it seems to be to exist a, a trail between how much more better can you put in your software, your plastic software. If you would find that, you know, whatever the kind of problem or the kind of decision that at some point you have to where I'm not in one of them, do I leave this or so I get faster? Yeah, so um, I don't really program an arm. Um, but I know where your problem is coming from because you're creating another component for the virtual machine to have to deal with. So I guess it's important to note that um, R works on a virtual machine, so it's got to keep track of all these states that, uh, or all these components that are, that are live. And so basically, when you've created another module of R, it's living somewhere in memory and then it has to access it. So that's where the slowness is coming from. Uh, if you're using a compiled language, and no, you won't have. Problems because the compiler is actually going to take your module, which is readable, and then turn that into inline code. But we don't we don't get that from uh, interpreted languages. So uh, one solution for you might be to use the R uh, just in time compiler. So if that's out there, that might help you with that. Use. I haven't used it, but I, I would imagine what it's doing is creating your module and putting it into machine code. So.
Right. Yeah, so uh, most C++ compilers will optimize as they compile. You can tell the optimization. Um, for instance, um, uh, one of the projects that I work on, we use a technique called expression templates. So uh, we're optimizing in several different ways, but when we compile something, Teresa knows this, when you compile something like MAS or ATL, um, it takes a long time to compile because the compiler is working really hard to optimize everything. But basically, because of the, this technique, we're not only telling the compiler to optimize, but because we're using expression templates, it's just automatically going to optimize. So it's optimizing on every possible level. So um, it, it's actually inlining and optimizing code. And, and so that's one of the great things about a, a compiled language. There's a question about modularity. Yeah, it's critical. Um, I guess I didn't do a good job communicating that. But um, so in this modeling phase right here, going back to this line, um, this is where we're, the end product of this is going to be our design document. So we're going to look at what we need to do to come up with the solution. And then the product of modeling the code is going to be the design document. And then we take that into the development phase. So development is based on what is in the design. Yeah, so you, you continuously update the design document. Is that planning documents, design documents, or living documents? So if you go into a new phase of development, you know, you're, you're going to update both of those. Good question. Anybody else? No, um, it's not going to be a problem because we've modularized the problem itself. Right? So we can extend any of those modulars. Let's say you just wanted to, um, one day you wanted to make recruitment deviations around it. Right? But then you just come back and you, you address that in that module. You'll extend that and, and make it able to switch and use random effects there. Understand the question. So, saying, how can you start off with a basic framework and extend it to use these different features? Yeah, you know, inheritance and things like that will help you. Um, but basically, because you modularize the problem, if you modularize it well, um, those topics are going to fall within some module that you can expand. Um, that's the whole point of structured programming or even object programming. All that information is going to be encapsulated in one section or one module. And so that's where you would address that in that module. So, so you're going to have like the basic framework and then all these components or all these modules that uh, are hopefully in an extensible state. 
And so you can address that. Does that make sense? Kind of. Maybe we'll talk more off the line. Anybody else? Oh. Reason. Uh, who invited her? Uh, so you, you're talking about applying this to something that's already done? Well, that's hard. <laughs> um, this is the problem. If you come up with a project that hasn't used this, these phases of development, somebody just sat there, you know, how do you plug it into this? You really can't. So is that what you're saying? Is that what you're getting at? It's almost impossible to do. Yeah, I mean, you could, you'd have to go like your code review process and you'd have to identify all the modules, modules of the code. And then you would have to come up with a, a secondary plan, probably a maintenance plan, and you would address all these issues and go back uh, communication with stakeholders and planning for future maintenance rather than development would be future maintenance and then things you have to do. So this this uh, list would change a little bit. Alan? Okay, yeah, so, okay, so that, you, you understood it better than I did, I guess. So, uh, if you're talking about something like C++ or a template, uh, yeah, so what Alan was saying is that you could code the whole thing using just a double, right? And then later on, you could throw in an essence of a little bit variable, right? And the code should still run the same, but you'd be able to extract the version of the model. So, thanks, Alan, for clarifying that. Oh, absolutely acceptable. That's that's reusability, right? I'm a big fan of uh, temple programming. I'm a huge fan of that. For, for Well, that really depends on the size of the project. Right, I know what you're saying. Um, that's that's why I'm saying that uh, when, you, when you go through these steps, uh, when you talk about planning and modeling, you're talking about really detailed information. If you hire someone, the first thing you have to do is read those documents. So now they're clear on the functionality of software and how it's supposed to be done. So you're getting off the speed really fast. It's a lot easier to do that than read code, right? Especially for understand. So uh, as far as how long this cycle takes, really depends on the scope of the project. Generalized stock assessment program, not going to be a monitor. So you might not get your first version out until a year. Or two. There. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, so if you have stuff, it's not going to change. Um, you can 
using the uh, compile those components into a dynamically linked library. And so then your code base actually becomes pretty small. Okay. And so at one point you can move those in. So the smaller your code base, the faster it's going to come. So you can imagine what your compiler is doing. It's going over your code. It's kind of, it's kind of removed. Right? So you're not creating a whole thing. Then it's going to go through your stuff. So yeah, sometimes compiling is a long time. That may also take some literally a minute. Okay. Um, yeah, but he's talking about compiling on the Okay, let me get a question. When do you know when you should keep maintaining the program well? This is the most question about what you do. And can you keep some of the things that you've done in the previous project? Yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, so, how do you know when, it's, when you can switch up? Well, basically, how many end users are using that like, legacy code? You know, sometimes it's, you keep legacy code around because it's still useful, right? but you're not going to develop anymore. And so, when you get to that point where you're not going to develop anymore on it, that's when you start looking at a new solution. You still have the legacy solution that keeps you going while you develop it. So you really do and then at some point in time, you're going to work on a transition from legacy. Okay. Yeah, sure. We'll use some code. Uh, you might follow the structure. I mean, you're talking about copy and paste or just Logic for both. Yeah. So uh, last week I was in Hawaii working on a project with my colleagues, and I ripped off some of the stuff. So this is code. That's it. I ripped it off. So I did reuse it. Yeah. You I, I really, I do believe all of them. Um, programming is such a huge component of fishery science. You know, whether it's R, ADMB, TMB, you know, all the concepts apply. I think, you know, two or three courses in, in a real programming language would really be really helpful for any grad student. You know, especially an object oriented programming language. C. Distinguish among the students in terms of how much programming they had, not because the program reads better, but because it's right sometimes. Um, most of the time it's wrong, uh, but it's bad. You know, if someone has to be debug a homework assignment, you can see the design straight because just the structure is there. You can actually find other people's bugs a lot easier. So um, the danger difficulty is actually. Having classes that are suitable for for people with scientific training, we just don't really. That's not a special area. It's very much the you talk to a science expert. Or something. Um, so if there is a lack there. We, we, we probably do need to work on. Yeah, I agree. I mean, because it's such a huge component of true scientists. I'm just, I'm just wondering how we apply these modularity functions to 
programming in ADMB with TPL doesn't have that structure that C++ itself does, or how does that get integrated? Uh, functions. Modularized through functions. Instead of putting all the logic in one function, you separate it off. You, you organize the code. It's still modular. Just make sure that uh, your functions are self describing Yeah. Is it uh, a good recommendation to tell them to just use the base language such that the code is like a C plus plus code or similar? Or do you want to get away with I guess it depends on what the products are end up being. It's just one part, one thing, but um, deep dependencies cause issues. So you're, you're describing as a, a dependency. These are things that are kind of a black box. I, I steer. I would steer away from that. Okay. Um, if there's if there's no more questions, uh, we'll break for coffee and back. Uh, thank you. Everyone.